know. Yes, I sound funny. I have a negative COVID test. I don't have a temperature. I smelled my coffee this morning. <laughs> I think it's okay. Um, and I will not be drinking or eating anything today, so the mask is staying 100% on. So anyway, um, just want to like put that out there. So first off, um, just before I introduce Matt, I want to say um, yesterday you should have gotten an email with information from Debbie Roos, including a survey. Um, we do this for the surveys, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> like, the surveys are super important. I know she really, really values that. If you haven't filled it out already, please take a minute and fill that out for her. Um, it's so, so useful for what we do, so we can do it better, right? Like that's the whole point, is getting better. So please do that. The first part of your final project is due next week. Um, if you have any questions about it, please, you can reach out to, um, you can always reach out to me. I will probably put you in contact with Marianne Chap or Kim Cherry because they are the wonderful folks who wrote this and so they can give you all the answers. Um, reach out with any questions, but I just want you to know that the first part of your project, well, your project in general, but especially the first part, we're checking in to make sure that like it's okay, like you're going okay. And if it's not, we're just gonna give you some gentle feedback and be like, hey, you're shuffling in that direction and we hope you'd be shuffling in that direction, right? Like it's not scary, nothing bad is gonna happen. This is a nice, just halfway through check-in, okay? So it's all okay, you guys are gonna pull through. Um, and know that there are a lot of different ways to accomplish your project. You might interpret things differently. We will be looking for, are you getting the kind of information that we're looking for and are you putting it in a way that makes sense to you, right? Like we will try to meet you more than halfway to be like, this isn't how I would have done it, but it's how you did it and it answered the question and that's great. Ashley? Yes? What do you expect this to give you a binder or send to the file or how, what, what does that mean? That's a great question. So again, it's actually, it's up to you. If you're a binder kind of lady, I want a binder. If you're a digital file kind of person, send me, Ashley, your digital file. I will include that um, in today's email, but whatever format is most comfortable to you, that's how I want it, right? Um, but if it's a digital file, please send it to me directly and I will share it back out with the folks who will be looking over it. And then finally, next week is veggies. The reason I'm telling you that is because in the afternoon we have an optional field trip to Briggs to really learn more about that space. That's our community garden space. That will be from 2.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. It is entirely optional. That is like for your edification. I will not think that you're not interested if you can't make it, um, right? Like I, that's entirely optional. Briggs is actually a space you can get out to in a number of different ways. We just wanted to make sure you had a chance to get a tour if you, if you were able to make it and interested. Yes? Will there be tours any other time? We kind of do them sporadically. Um, the one thing I said too is that Briggs has work days most Friday and Saturday mornings. And if you show up and you're like, what is this? Like someone will answer your questions, right? Like they will give you kind of an informal tour. You might not get to see like all the bells and whistles of a planned tour, but like, it'll be worth your time. It'll be worth your time. So are there any other, yes? Just a reminder, they have a fall fest on yes. Saturday. So remind too, they're doing like uh, fall plant starts. They're selling those, but they have free seeds. Um, I think they're doing like fall, winter garden, yeah, it's going to be awesome. There's like a hot pepper table. There's a bunch of free flower seeds. There are beautiful looking fall veggie starts. I've seen them. They look great. Um, it is a fundraiser for Briggs. They do one in the spring and one in the fall now, and they've done a great job growing all those plants. And um, that, that was my plan for fall veggies this year. I was like, I don't need to grow my own. Briggs does a good job. So they do a really good job. So that is this Saturday out at Briggs. Anything else? Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's in here. I don't, in my area that I want to work on, I may not have, at, at next week, I'll have everything else pretty much ready, I hope, but I won't have a clear idea of what I want to plant in there yet, or what I want to do, specifically. Do I have time to, so I have everything else, I'm, I'm going through all my plant labeling throughout the property. You'll be totally fine. But in the area that I'm working on, mm -hmm. I don't, I have exactly decided what I want to put in there, it's not a large area. That's okay. Just start with IDing what you have and like filling out everything else and like that's totally fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. I've got my cheat sheet up here. Barbara is nice enough to give me a cheat sheet of what's in the first part versus the second part. Any other questions? 
Okay, so with that, I am going to introduce one of my absolute favorite speakers we have. This is Matt Jones. Last week we went to Chatham. This week, Chatham comes to us. <laughs> um, this is their horticulture agent. He is absolutely phenomenal. You were an agent where else? In Harnett. In Harnett County. So he's like, don't be confused by his boyish good looks. He's actually been an agent for a minute. He's really, really good at what he does. He has really? all sorts of fancy degrees. Um, Matt is so much fun. So with that, I'm going to let you take it away. Cool. Thank you, Ashton. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I, 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 um, before, sorry, before I came to North Carolina, I worked in California, and when I was looking across the country, looking for extension agencies to go to, North Carolina came up uh, partially because uh, of Durham County Master Garden Program. Um, you guys it had, it had podcasts for a long time, it's just really prominent, and I want to emphasize that you're part of a really excellent program here. And, um, Extension has got a lot of good things going in a lot of the rural counties, a lot of the farmers know what we do, but we've been around 110 years or whatever. But in areas, especially like the Triangle, where there's so many more people coming in, um, it is vitally important that they have a connection to Extension uh, through you all. Because there's, there, yes, there's a lot of farmers in the state, and we're, and we're actually, we have the second largest rural population in the country. Uh, after Texas, um, and agriculture is our biggest industry still. But um, uh, in terms of the number of people that can impact, like environmental impacts and, and other impacts that you can have, it's the people moving to urban areas. So uh, uh, you just, it's, it's, you're going to be doing great work here. So, so good for you. <laughs> so, so, so just, just keep that in mind. Like, you, you, what all the stuff you're doing, you're volunteering for, is really important. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a triangle, it's a cool place to be. So, uh, but so today, um, I hope that everyone has done some reading. Uh, and, and you know, traditionally we kind of do long lectures and that sort of thing. But but today I want to kind of do a compressed lecture that covers, give you like a, a, an overview of, of diseases, um, and a little bit on diagnostic skills and a little bit on research methods. And when we're done with that, that's about an hour ish. We'll take a break and we'll come back and do two different um, exercises. And they'll be in small groups. Um, if you ha it's helpful if, if you happen to have your smart device or computer or something with you to do research. But if you don't have that, that's okay. Within the group, um, you can still, still interact and, and, and do the exercises. So we'll go through those. And uh, basically, you'll be giving it a, a chance to try and diagnose different kinds of diseases and disorders uh, using extension based information. And then at the end of the class, we'll go over the answers to that. And the lecture itself, um, uh, like I said, a very quick overview of, of, of what diseases are, abiotic and biotic. And then uh, some, uh, the, we'll go over the diagnostic method that's recommended in the handbook. And then uh, I'll highlight some of the places you can go to find research-based information. But first, um, to, to piggyback on, on Ashley's comment, um, uh, Today's talk is, is brought to you by Ragweed. So if I start sneezing and I cry, it's not because I'm in, uh, you know, I just touched a beer. But also, uh, I just started seeing Ragweed blooming uh, Tuesday. And this is a, uh, a fun plant, right? It's, it's in the Aster family, Asteraceae. It's like, along with 15,000 other species, literally. Um, but unlike a lot of Asters, the heads, the heads, which is the type of the fluorescence they have, are, are highly reduced, and they have separate male and female flowers in different hens. And it's the male flowers, of course, that produce pollen, and the pollen uh, is evolved to be dispersed by wind. And so um, they, they, these tiny pollen, pollen grains, which are um, male plants that contain sperm cells, um, go way up in nasal passages, and they have proteins that bind with you and cause all sorts of fun um, uh, reactions in some people. Um, don't blame it on the goldenrod. The goldenrod is blooming at the same time. That's another member of the aster family. Uh, bright yellow flowers. Usually there are some species with white flowers. Um, uh, but uh, they, they get a bad reputation because they bloom at the same time. This is your true enemy. So if I start sneezing, it's not good. <laughs> uh, now, okay, so before you can decide on if a, uh, what a disease is or what a, a disorder is on a plant, 
it, you really have to know what normal looks like, what healthy looks like. You have to be able to draw that comparison between um, uh, what, what, uh, what a pathogen or an environmental factor or cultural factor might be doing at that point. And sometimes what is healthy can look weird. So, um, for example, you will look at this, uh, this uh, juniper, uh, juniper is Virginia or, or Amer uh, Eastern Red Cedar, look at the tips and you might wonder, what is this brown stuff at the tip? This, this kind of reddish brownish form formation. That's actually just, those are actually the male cones. That's not, that's not a pathogen. That's just the, bio, the reproductive structure of the juniper. Or like some cultivars, this is a cultivar of honey locust that um, naturally has yellow leaves during the peak of the season. Uh, you know, during the growing season, not 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 in fall. I mean, in fall they'll stay yellow and they'll fall off. But in like in the middle of summer and spring, they come out as yellow. So there's nothing wrong with that point. So knowing that that variety um, has that characteristic is important. Similarly, uh, you see, you might see on some plants uh, the margins are looking like lighter in color, or even in between the veins that can happen. Well, sometimes that can be indicative of a nutrient deficiency. Other times, like in this case. Um, for these these mints, um, that is just a variegation. So it's a mutation that horticulturalists have bred into the plant, and that's how it's supposed to look. So knowing how things are supposed to look, knowing what normal is, is important kind of baseline consideration when doing diagnosis. Similarly, um, if you've ever seen these organisms growing on trees, those are lichens. That is a it's a dual organism. It's a combination of a fungus with a green algae or a cyanobacteria, a blue-green algae, and they grow on plants, but they're not infecting plants. They're, they're, they're epiphytic, they're epi meaning outside, but it being plant. Um, now, can, if you see a lot of these on a tree or shrub accumulating, that can be indicative of uh, slow growth, because if a tree is growing at normal rates, as the, as the trunk expands, it's shedding bark, so you'll see a kind of constant rate of shedding on a healthy tree in most environments. But if it's like in an urban lot and you see this tree and you see it looking like, well, some of the, uh, there's some branch die back and there's also a lot of lichen, that might be a problem with the lichen are not causing the problem, right? So don't blame the lichen. Uh, similarly to the, um, the juniper I showed you, uh, ferns, if you look at the, bo the bottom of a lot of fern leaves in certain times of year, they'll have these round formations. Um, they're not diseases, those aren't fungi. They are called sori. They're quite sight sori. And uh, those are the uh, reproductive structures. These are groups of what are called sporangia, so spore producing uh, structures. So there's nothing wrong with this fern. It looks a little freaky, but it's totally fine. And finally, like in some species, uh, they won't shed bark like an oak or maple will. They'll shed it in kind of larger sheets, and that's perfectly normal too. You will get it. I, I've gotten calls. My master gardeners have gotten calls. My birch tree is shaking like crazy. What's for like the bark's falling off? I'm like it's all right. It's, it's supposed to do that. So so again, just really knowing what is normal and knowing what diseases are is a good place to start. Now one question. It's like a an initiation <laughs> ceremony for for um, for master gardeners is to get a question about there's this fungus growing in my lawn and my mulch. It's going to eat everything. Toto's gone now. This is this is nothing to worry about. This is uh, actually in the the kind of colloquial or term is dog vomit fungus because of its delightful appearance. But it's actually a type of slime mold. Um, it's more of a uh, protist-like organism, not a true fungus. And oftentimes it's in this kind of this this unicellular form. But under certain conditions, it will uh, form a colony and then reproduce and release spores. Uh, but it's just, it's just part of the natural, or the organisms in the mulch or in the soil that are part of um, a decomposition process. So it's not causing any harm to any plants at all. It just looks unpleasant. So don't worry about the dog bomb fungus and um, save, save some money and don't take your dog to the vet. Looking at diseases themselves, we tend to group them into two different broad categories. Abiotic diseases, which more properly I would call disorders, and biotic diseases. And that means it is either caused by a pathogenic organism or it is not. So if most, most of the time when you think of disease, you probably are thinking of some sort of 
other organism infecting a plant or an animal or a human. Um, but, but many problems are caused by other factors, so cultural factors, so it was planted the wrong way, or like environmental factors, stress from, from uh, lack of too much water or temperature, etc. And in uh, many cases, uh, this is not a bad place to start. Uh, just assume <laughs> it was user error or there's something environmentally affecting it. Rule that out first because this, and if you look at just, just the number of calls that come in or emails that come in and you were to, to, to tabulate how many were abiotic disorders and how many were actually pathogenic diseases, I bet you would find the vast majority are actually some abiotic disorder or, or abiotic disease problem rather than a pathogen. So just because it's looking funny, first of all, know what funny is, and then don't assume it's caused necessarily by a pathogenic organism. There are different ways you can kind of distinguish between these two kinds of phenomena. Uh, one, a, a abiotic disorder, or something that's caused by a cultural or environmental factor, tends to appear very suddenly, whereas a pathogenic disease, uh, a biotic disease, tends to appear more slowly. A, uh, so, for example, if there is a freeze overnight, you're going to see a lot of things affected at once. You're also going to see it affecting many uh, not closely related species. And um, the pattern will appear rather uniform and linear, and there tends to be a very distinct separation between what was affected and what wasn't affected. That is, all those factors are not the case with biotic diseases. Here, imagine that if you're a pathogenic organism, you better to, first of all, be dispersed onto a host. The host has to be the right kind of host, so the right kind of plant. And then it has to undergo an infection process. And once it penetrates the tissue, it's going to spread slowly as it grows in the organism. So therefore, it's going to, it could, depending on how it landed, where it landed on the plant, it could be a, it's going to be a pretty random pattern. And then it's going to usually spread very slowly and it's going to spread um, uh, gr gradually into the tissue, and you'll see a often, not always, but often you'll see a transition between uh, unaffected tissue to newly infected tissue to tissue that's been affected for a while. So for example, this can manifest as uh, like dark brown, black tissue at the center that may be even falling out from the leaf, for example, and then it turns, and then in a circular pattern turns to like a yellow uh, color, and then a red pattern at the outer edge and then back to green. So you'll see this transition from as the infection proceeds from the original infection point. But again, but really most, I would say most commonly in type, the types of calls you will get or the types of queries you'll get will probably be an abiotic problem. But quickly again, uh, most of those um, are going to be, not those, but many of, the, of those abiotic factors are going to be, probably could be a user error, especially with trees and shrubs. Uh, some things to remember about trees and shrubs, uh, one, they take a long time to die, and sometimes the symptoms are slow to appear. By the time they are starting to appear and people notice it, it's probably way too late to do anything about it, um, and the problem that initiated caused it would probably occur a while ago. And especially in, in urban, suburban areas, anytime where a house was newly built or something like that and a tree was planted, it's not infrequent, one, to the, for the conditions to be quite poor. We have, we'll have, uh, if it's especially in a new development, the soils are highly compacted. Um, and often the contractors doing the planting are doing a terrible job planting the tree for a number of reasons. Um, or they have selected a tree that is maybe uh, widely available in the nursery industry and easy to obtain. Uh, inexpensive to obtain, and uh, may but may not be well suited for compacted soils and urban urban conditions. And urban can mean suburban and rural. In this case, I just mean the area that where a house is built. Um, so uh, the trees, especially, really think about what's what was wrong with the planting process. Look at planting depth. Uh, look at too much uh, mulch around the base. Don't you know, this is this is the you know like the cardinal sin. Um, in, in tree cares to have a pile of mulch covering the trunk. You think the trunk was meant to be in the ground? No, that's what roots are for. So, um, in, in most cases. Uh, so, you know, all those can cause problems with, with long-term tree decline. Also, in the case of shrubs, if, they're, if people are into heavy pruning, make sure you 
know the species and know when they're supposed to be pruned because sometimes the flower buds will appear on new growth, so growth from that spring, and it'll, it'll, it'll grow and bloom later that summer. Other cases, if they often if they bloom in spring, that the buds were produced the previous year. So if you are pruning before the flowers appear, then you might have eliminated your flowers, and that's why your plant isn't blooming. <laughs> it's not a nutrient issue or something like that. And then, uh, obviously, environmental factors, temperature extremes are handy and important, uh, and have important effects on plants. Uh, we've had mild winters the past two years, right? Uh, well, I mean, we had some late freezes, I guess. But, but so freeze damage, meaning there's, there's major damage from ice crystals forming in the tissue level and piercing cells and all that. And then also chilling injury. So some, some uh, especially in, uh, for warm season, say vegetable crops that probably originated in the tropics originally, uh, they are more susceptible to colder temperatures that are above freezing, called chilling injury. You can see various uh, injuries from, from that. And that can manifest in different species in different ways. And then likewise in heat, um, uh, you know, drought obviously is, is well, we'll get that in the next slide, but but um, uh, really hot temperatures can, can directly uh, damage tissue, especially say if a plant has shade color and is planted in the, put, put in the sun, or in often the case of peppers, um, there can be pests that remove leaves um, that shade the developing fruit, and if that fruit is suddenly exposed to a bunch of light, you can get um, sunburn or sun scorch on the, on the pepper. So even though this looks kind of nasty, that's not an infectious disease, that's a, a, a abiotic disorder of the fruit. Obviously too much or too little water can be a, a major issue. Uh, uh, plants transpire water, they absorb water from the roots through as they evaporate water out of the leaves, right? Um, so they are constantly have to balance um, losing too much water versus taking in carbon dioxide. And uh, sometimes if they, you know, I'm not trying to anthropomorphize them, but, but if physiologically, it's so, they're so water deprived, they decide to close their stomata to prevent water loss, they can't photosynthesize in many cases. Um, so they will decline over the long term, they can't go get water. Um, and uh, so that's, that's not good. Um, and then in other cases, so too much water can be problematic in two different ways. One, uh, roots need oxygen. Plants use oxygen. If they're growing, they are, emit, they are producing more oxygen than they're consuming, but they still use oxygen the same way we do to break down starches and sugars. And if the roots don't have enough oxygen, if they're not adapted to really wet conditions, then the roots will die. Um, secondly, uh, a wet conditions can favor the development of certain kinds of pathogens that otherwise would not infect plants, particularly say things like Phytophthora rubra, which you may or may not see today, <laughs> the activity. And of course, uh, if you if we're talking to cover your soils class already, you know about nutrient deficiencies, so some, uh, sometimes nutrient deficiencies can manifest in certain symptoms uh, in, in, the, uh, in the above ground parts of the plant, but um, meaning lack of fertilizer, lack of nutrients, but also the application of too much fertilizers can damage because fertilizers are ultimately all the chemically salts, and that can cause um, issues as well. And then lastly, from, well no, second to lastly, <laughs> uh, in ultimate, um, uh, errant fertilizer spray can be a cause in some cases of uh, plant injuries. So this means that uh, either you apply herbicides on the wrong plant, or herbicides drifted through, through uh, volatilization, uh, uh, but non-target plants can be harmed even by occasionally small amounts of uh, uh, herbicide. The one, one that's more prone to volatilization and spread are, are two, is 2,4-D in certain formulations. Glyphosate is good in that it does not, it, it binds the soil very tightly, so it's not likely to spread in the soil or anything, but, but if, you're, if you're aiming for a weed next to a, 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 a say, a grassy, well, any actually, it has a life, any, any plant, that you're wanting to kill, uh, but you misapply it or you apply it on the wrong plant or something like that, you can still cause some, some injury in small amounts. And uh, Dr. Joe Neal is our weed science guru on campus, uh, and he has a good web page about um, different kinds of herbicide injury um, by any kind of herbicide uh, uh, chemical structure you can, you can sort it that way. So uh, you can go through his hat. And everyone will get a copy of this presentation. So. Um, and the links will be active in the PDF too. Sorry. And uh, uh, you 
user, another types of user error can be, say, damage from line trimmers or string trimmers, weed whackers. Um, I have found that the uh, oh, this carefully. Uh, the uh, male partner and heteronormative relationships they tend to be more <laughs> commonly causing issues like this. They can be a pest that uh, uh, can cause issues if they're getting a little uh, confident about their weed trimming skills. So it can be helpful to put mulch around trees for many reasons, but one of those is to keep your husband away from the tree with the <laughs> string hammer. Um, and then uh, even weird random acts, random acts of nature can cause issues. Uh, hail damage it can be sporadic and random sometimes, uh, and you'll see big holes in the leaves like, what the heck happened? And just check check the weather to see if it, it hailed the night before, especially in larger leaf plants. And then even lightning can be an issue, like in crop fields, that can be you won't have to, to diagnose soybean damage or anything, but uh, there can be a strange patterns of lightning striking fields and even trees. Uh, my first day of interning one day was they put me to one part of the arboretum and said, clean up this exploded tree. Uh, so that was cool. So that was a lightning strike on a uh, hemlock. Uh, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and okay, so that, those, are, those are abiotic disorders uh, in, in a nutshell. Um, now, looking at uh, what I think are the more fun things, which is the, the pathogenic diseases, what do those look like? They can take many different forms, they can infect different types of organisms, can infect different parts of different kinds of plants at different times, in different situations. Uh, sometimes they infect roots, they can infect leaves, fruits, shoots, flowers, uh, seeds, seedlings, and, and uh, different, kinds of, different kinds of pathogens will have different kinds of symptoms on different kinds of plants, parts, and different kinds of species. But we, we categorize the effects, or rather, what we're seeing on the plant in two different ways. And if, have we had insects yet? No. Mm -hmm. We have, okay. So in the insects class, I'm sure you talked about signs and symptoms. That also applies to diseases. So a sign is direct evidence, like you can see the actual infectious agent on the plant. And in the case of uh, a pathogenic diseases, if it's a fungus, which we'll talk about in a second, you'll see the actual parts of the fungus growing on the plant. That's a sign of a fungal infection. This can be the uh, vegetative part, meaning the, the part, the main body of the fungus, so the, the, the hyphae, the little strands that are growing and eating things, digesting things. Uh, and then also the reproductive structure, which are called fruiting bodies. And out of those reproductive structures, the fruiting bodies, they release spores. So anytime you see these, that can be a, a, a direct sign of a fungal infection. Now, bacteria, as we'll see, are going to be much, much smaller. Um, and so it's hard to see individual bacterial cells without the right equipment. But in plants, you can do something called the ooze test, which I'll show you in a few slides. But in this case, it is, you, you can, well, I'll still tell you now. And if you, if, you, uh, if you suspect a potential bacterial infection and you're able to destructively sample the plant, so uh, cut, cut the stem, put it in water, and you see the streaming effect, it's like, white oozy stuff in the water, then that's, that's lots and lots of bacteria, probably from a vascular wilt infection. Um, plant pathologists have uh, overlapping and not always consistent terms for describing symptoms on plant tissues. A lot of times, if it's a, it, uh, you'll see uh, the injuries, the symptoms on a leaf is called a spot. So if it's like a roughly circular pattern, especially if it's uh, uh, you know brown or black or, or yellow or, or red, it's got certain colorations that look consistent with where how you expect to see a pathogen landing on a leaf and growing, then it's called a spot. Um, blight is a term that usually means like general dieback on one side of the plant. So really destructive, like leaves and stems are all dying. A dieback is even kind of broader than a, a, a blight. A blight often you can, um, well, a blight is almost always used in the case of a, a, a bio, biological pathogen, a dieback, but that, that's on the effect that's on the symptomatic tissue. But then dieback, you might, it could be a root problem that is manifesting in one branch or sets of branches dying back. Uh, and then stunting means, they're not growing as, as well as they should be. They just look small and tiny as well, compared to what we expect. A wilt is a specific description for a type of disease that's infecting 
the vascular tissue, so the phloem or xylem of the plant that are allowing water or uh, uh, food transport in the plant. And it's called the wilt because if those, are full, if those vessels are full of fungi or bacteria, water can't move through the leaves or wilting, right? And then rots mean a kind of soft, mushy, uh, generalized destruction of the of tissue. Usually it's with reference to fruits. Uh, cankers mean uh, any sort of sunken lesion, often on stems, but not always. And then models or mosaics are a little like spotty, spotty symptoms on the leaves that are usually caused by viral infections. The uh, handbook has a more thorough description of all these two, but this is going to give you an overview. So, so often then, when you come across a disease, um, you, you might want to, well, one, when you'll see the description of it, so it could say, uh, uh, bacterial spot of pepper. So it's, it's a spot symptom caused by a bacteria that's occurring on bell pepper. Uh, vascular bacterial wilt of tomato or uh, 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 the fusaria wilt of tomato, um, uh, fruit rot of peach, etc. So it usually is it's in reference describing both the, the host and um, often the general category of the cause of aging of the disease. And so, so use that to your advantage when you're doing research. Um, if, you, if you see a leaf spot on a pepper, a good query might be leaf spot of pepper, you know, uh, et cetera. Uh, there are three and a half uh, organisms that can cause diseases. Uh, three of them are actually uh, what we would call pathogenic disease organisms. Nematodes, those are a type of animal, so they're, they're a primitive type of animal. Nothing wrong with being primitive, but actually they're really intelligent anatomy. But, uh, due to their, their, the, the types of nematodes that can infect plants or feed on plants are very, very tiny compared to some of the ones that feed on animals. Uh, and so uh, in the way that the discipline of plant pathology developed, plant pathologists end up studying nematodes, but it's really an animal. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's uh, the types of things that can cause diseases are fungi, bacteria, viruses, and nematodes. Now, for any of these to cause a problem on a plant, um, there's a paradigm in plant pathology called the disease triangle, or sometimes the disease pyramid. And in this schema, 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 schema uh, you have a, a three parts of the triangle that have to be in place in order for disease to occur. You have to have a plant or a host that is susceptible to that disease. So, Many, most diseases have host specificity. That means a disease that will infect a pepper probably is not capable of infecting a juniper and vice versa. So they, they've evolved to only be able to, to evade the defenses of a certain group of species. The, a, a, a corollary to that is that the more closely related two species are, the more likely that they could be infected by similar diseases. So, a disease that, say, occurs on a tomato might also occur on a pepper or eggplant because those are closely related uh, species. So a, a, you got to have the right kind of host, and then the, obviously in order to have a disease, the disease-causing agent has to be present. So that disease has to be able to land on the, the susceptible host, and that can be transported by air or water or even animals can move diseases around. Uh, and then all those, both of those things have to be uh, occurring under conditions that enable the disease-causing organism to cause infection, so the, environment, the proper environmental conditions. If, you, if all those three are present, then you will have a disease, but if, it, but if one of those three is not present, you will not have a successful disease manifest, or a successful infection that manifests as a disease. Uh, so in some aspects of disease management, what you're trying to do is target one of those, those parts of the triangle. So, um, do something about the pathogen, use a fungicide or something. Maybe use a resistant variety, or make sure you're not growing it in conditions that are favorable to disease. The other thing that is now in the new scheme with the, the disease pyramid, 
uh, is time. So there's also a, if you think of this as a three-dimensional period, you can think of time as another part, so you can take some time to affect it. But, um, uh, yeah. So um, again, quickly, um, bio, bio diseases are limited certain dose if you're reviewing. They tend to, the appear, symptoms appear to, appear, uh, appear to seem to appear, or tend to appear slowly. And you'll see often a transition zone like in this, this is a, uh, I think a fungal disease of a bean plant. And at the center of these brown spots is where the infection first occurred. So the, the spore landed on the leaf and then the spore germinated and was growing inside the tissue. And as it grew, it kind of grew out of the circular pattern. And so uh, the brown parts of the spot are where it's done its thing. And then the yellow parts are where it's moving into new territory. And so it keeps expanding. So this is a very, this is a very nice sign. Like if you see transitions like this, you can. There's a high probability it is a uh, pathogenic or biotic disease. Uh, and good. Um, well, I'll go briefly over the, the I would say the, the three primary um, disease causing agents. Nematodes are kind of a thing. We don't see too many of them. It's less of an issue in Piedmont soils. Most of them, most nematodes. Roots. There are some polio nematodes, but the nematodes tend to thrive in sandier soils. But uh, so we'll focus on these three for now. Um, but I will I will attach additional slides to talk about nematodes too. So fungi are uh, the, the, the most um, in terms of sheer number of diseases that occur on plants. Fungi cause the majority. Of them. Uh, so you know if you had to pinpoint it down, start with fungi or assume fungi before you can, can assume bacteria. Uh, so a fungus, I mean, if you think of a, a mushroom, that is just the reproductive structure of a fungus, of a certain type of fungi. And most of what's happening with a fungus is that, that underground, growing in the soil and among plants and in the detritus, are thin cells called a hyphae. And to get collectively that mat of, of uh, strands of cells is called the mycelium. And uh, that is what's doing most of the work of the fungus. That's the main body of the fungus. So it's excreting digestive enzymes at the tips, and they're exploring and growing and, and digesting things, and et cetera. Then at a certain point, if conditions are right, it'll produce a reproductive structure. And the one you might be familiar with is, is like, is like a, a mushroom, right? Uh, but there are all kinds of different sorts of, of reproductive structures in fungi. But, but from those reproductive structures, spores will be released and those are what can infect plants or people or that sort of thing. Uh, so in that case, a spore will land on a plant and then it produces this structure that is really good about penetrating plant tissue. Uh, they, they, there's a, they, there's a, it's like a high pressure mechanism and it will pierce right through otherwise healthy tissue and under the right conditions. Contrast that as we'll see with bacteria, they can't do that. They need an open wound or, or an opening or an AO wound. Uh, so, so fungi can are, are, are a little more advanced than, than at, at infecting uh, plants. Fungi are more like us than they are bacteria. And in fact, they're more like us than they are like plants, actually. Um, um, so they're cellularly, that's what they're like. Uh, and uh, they can cause all kinds of different diseases. They can cause spots and bites and cankers and, uh, and diebacks and falls. And every, every one of those types of descriptions are in reference, or can be a reference to a fungus. Um, if you see the word rust or smut, that is almost exclusively, a, uh, that is exclusively a fungal disease. Um, a rust, rust and smuts are caused by a certain group of fungi. But just because it appears rusty, <laughs> so if it, it looks like it has, it's orange on the leaf, does not mean it is a rust disease. That's a, a, that's a specific kind of not an issue. Uh, and then fungi can also have really complicated host life cycles. So say the smuts and rust especially are known for this, but uh, one of those is cedar apple rust, and you probably have seen this, but um, it has two phases of its life cycle that have different uh, uh, genetic, uh, amounts of genetic material, and in one phase of its life cycle it infects uh, apples and quinces and others in the rose family. And then as it infects that plant, it will then release spores, and those spores cannot infect other apples. It can only infect junipers. Uh, in this case, the, the eastern red cedar is not really a cedar, it's a juniper. Uh, 
And, and so it, those spores will land on a juniper and produce another kind of structure that looks rather terrifying. It's like this this size ball of gelatinous arms that's really quite fun. It won't hurt you, so it's a fun party trick to take one off and scare your kids or something. <laughs> and, and, and so then this structure will release another kind of spore that can only infect apples and their relatives. Um, in this case, there's not much you can do about it. You can, if you actually have apples that you're growing to eat apples, uh, or you're at an orchard or something, you can use fungicides, but if it's on a crab apple or something, it's, it, it, it's not going to kill the plant at all. Um, and the only thing, way to avoid it is to, you know, cut down every juniper within 20 miles of you, which is not, probably not practical. So, it's, it's an okay thing, don't let, don't let the, the client scare you, it's, it's, it, it won't really cause much damage. It won't cause any damage to the juniper at all, it just looks cool. Now bacteria, as I said, they're, they're much smaller organisms, uh, like, you know, orders of magnitude smaller than a plant cell or a fungal cell or an animal cell. A much simpler internal structure, uh, and then they, unlike fungi, they require an opening. So that can be some damage, like a wound from an animal chewing on it, for example, or some other abiotic influence, um, or it can be a, a natural opening. Like in the, this is a this is a uh, micrographic up close view of uh, a, a stomata uh, and guard cells. So these are the these are the pores on the uh, on the leaf that take in carbon dioxide and out of which um, water evaporates. And then these cells here are the gates, or the doors that open and close to allow that to happen. And a bacteria, through usually splashing of water, uh, can land right inside the stomata and suddenly you have a, a leaf infection. And there are other kinds of leaf structures that they can infect too. But uh, now, the ooze test, as I mentioned, is one way to figure out if you have a vascular wilt issue. So again, you cut apart the stem, you can look at um, the browning on the inside of the tissue if you cut away the outer part of the stem, but then you're like, you don't know if that's a bacterial or a fungal wilt, so stick it in water in a clear glass and see if it starts to ooze, then you know it's a bacterial wilt disease. But again, bacteria themselves can cause all sorts of issues, uh, galls and leaf spots and fruit rods, so a lot of the same symptomatic descriptors uh, that apply to fungi can be used for bacteria too. Finally, on uh, viruses, uh, we don't, I mean, viruses are an issue, not, I mean, usually it's an issue with uh, vegetable crops, on some vegetable crops that are not resistant. There's nothing you can do about viruses. If you've got a viral infection, you've got a viral infection on a plant. So um, it may or may not kill the plant, uh, but often it means just removing the plant. But a virus, as I think we've all gotten a good education on viruses, hopefully. Some of us have not, like 30% of the population, clearly has not. Um, um, but um, uh, they are a, some form of genetic material, either DNA or RNA, that's uh, bound in some sort of protein, protective protein compound uh, uh, structure. And it gets dispersed, uh, usually to plants, by some other vector. In the case of plants, it's usually insects. So an insect, We'll just go to a plant, feed on it, and it gets the virus on its body parts. It can also spread bacteria that way, by the way, too. And, and, and same thing sometimes with fungal spores. But it goes on to the next plant, bites that plant, eats that plant, then the virus gets in. Um, nothing, nothing you can do about it once it's infected, uh, but white flies and uh, trips, which are a type of insect you may have covered in the insect class, are very common virus, viral um, vectors. Symptoms um, often are splotchy, yellowing patterns on the leaves. That's called uh, a model or a mosaic. Uh, in other cases, that can, the similar patterns can happen on fruits. And then in other cases still, if, they, if the virus is in the, the, the uh, meristems, the growing tissues, the buds of a, of a plant that can cause crazy growth patterns to form like this witch's uh, fruit. Um, that's probably on a hay or something. Um, so yeah, so 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 cause of agents of, of, of disease. Most diseases are uh, fungi, lesser extent bacteria, and lesser extent still viruses. Now on to the diagnostic process 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 that will be helpful for today. Uh, first, we'll cover the uh, quickly cover the the process that has gone over in great detail in the diagnostics chapter of the Extension Garden Handbook. So. More details here. Uh, uh, look at that. But uh, the 
first step in that process is to make sure you know what plant you're dealing with. So correctly identify the plant. This is important not just for diagnosing problems, but to, 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 add, to answer any question that the client might have about the plant, is to know what it is. So again, different species are, uh, can be infected by different kinds of diseases due to host specificity um, from different kinds of fungi, bacteria, and viruses. And don't assume that the client knows what it is. They can tell you one thing, but they may be wrong. Um, so make sure you can verify uh, the symptoms or verify the identity of the plant if you can. It can, it, it can be helpful to know, especially in vegetables, uh, to rule out problems if you know the, the variety uh, of, the, of the affected plant. Because in many cases, they have, horticulturalists have uh, bred varieties to be, to be resistant to certain kinds of diseases. So if you have a, say, a tomato variety that you know is uh, uh, resistant to early blight, you can rule out early blight as a potential cause of the symptoms you're seeing. And again, emphasize, uh, like I said earlier, once you know what plant it is, know what it is normally supposed to look like. Um, so like, know, know that a, a certain types of uh, honey locust is supposed to be yellow, or know that, that ferns are supposed to have um, um, sore eye. That, that's, that's normal too. I am not probably. And then look at how the, uh, the pattern is appearing uh, both in the landscape and on the plant itself. In the landscape that means are you seeing, does the client see it on just one plant? If it's on just one, if it's on multiple plants, is it similar plant? Is it is it other plants of the same species or related species, or are the symptoms appearing on distantly related species? Is it showing up on a uh, um, a crab apple and a uh, uh, red bud, for example? Um, and then look at is it is it um, is it concentrated in one area or is it uniformly distributed over the whole area? Is um, is it uh, are you seeing uh, a difference, you see different issues on the same species in different parts of the, of the landscape. So is it, is it, are things occurring in a wet area or versus a dry area? And how are they changing through time? Do they appear suddenly? Do they appear slowly? Are they getting worse through time? Or is it, are you seeing the same, the same pattern over, uh, over an extended time amount of time? On the plant, look at the whole plant if you can. Uh, when Ashley and I have to submit samples to the plant disease and insect clinic, they are in a much better mood if you can submit the whole plant, and if you can't, say, submit a tree uh, to sample the soil with some roots um, uh, along with the tissue, because they want to be able to rule out uh, a nutrient issue or a pH issue, or be able to even look at the roots to look at the uh, potential root diseases. So um, look, look at the pattern on the plant, uh, what types of tissue or what types of organs is it occurring on? Is it occurring on the leaves? Is it on the stem? Is it on the flowers, on the fruits, on the shoots, on the roots? Is it occurring on new growth or old growth? That can be a important diagnostic sorter of sorts. Of, uh, 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 so say some, some disease of tomato will tend to occur on the lower or older growth uh, because if they can be splashed from soil at the bottom of the plant. Others, though, um, say are shifted by the, the wind, so they'll tend to occur on newer, higher up on the plant. Look for the lack of or presence of bullseye patterns. That can narrow down some symptoms a lot. And then uh, once you've kind of got an idea of how things are distributed, you know what the plant is and what it's supposed, supposed to look like, then start going through the four factors that can cause plant problems. And we've, we've gone over these already, but just to review, we have basically two kinds of abiotic causal factors. So usually a cultural problem, how they planted it, how they're watering it, how they're fertilizing it, or an environmental issue. So uh, too much light, not enough light, too much heat, not enough heat, too much cold, not enough cold, et cetera. And then the two biotic causal factors, we've talked about a lot of those diseases, but also don't forget pests. Uh, there are some, symptoms that pests cause that look like diseases and some disease symptoms that can look like pest damage in some cases. So, so the, really the differences can be quite subtle. Um, uh, so don't, don't, don't get to go, don't 
don't get don't get cocky, don't get arrogant, uh, and assume that you see a spot and think, oh, that's what they use for. So so make sure you can uh, rule that. So just like though, with um, quickly on on tests, just a reminder that this test can also produce signs or symptoms. A sign is some direct evidence of the past. So like um, uh, you actually see like the excrement of uh, caterpillars. You see the webbing caused by caterpillars. Cat skins, uh, galls, which are usually a feeding or reproductive structure of some kinds of insects. And they can damage plants in different ways. And th so this would be a symptom, really, is, is feeding damage. So they can, they may, and they can damage any parts of plants. There are certain pests can. Some of them feed on stems, some on roots, some on roots, some on shoots, some on leaves. And then some of them can even uh, spread diseases. So I mentioned earlier that uh, ASA aphids and thrips can spread viruses. Well, honeybees, or any bee, can spread uh, fireworks. So uh, there are bits of bacteria that tends to uh, colonize uh, the flowers of uh, pears and apples and, and, and relatives. And they're just doing their thing, trying to, trying to give you fruit, damn it. And, but in the process, they got bacteria on them and can you actually, you can actually spread disease. So, so that's, that, those are the five-ish steps in, from the handbook to think about as kind of a general idea, um, if you need a guide for that. There are other options too. So um, Virginia Tech has a sheet that you can link to and they have a QR code if you want. Um, the, the, they, they suggest going in this order, kind of asking the client how long has it been there. Then uh, I say, this is a really important question. Has anything been done recently? And sometimes you really have to pull that out of the client. Like, are you sure you did apply something recently? Did you fertilize? Did, you, did your husband or wife do it? Oh, maybe. So make sure try to get that out of them, and you know don't 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 judge them. You know, we're all trying we're all trying to figure out this gardening thing, and then think about recent weather conditions, ask about that, and then look for signs and symptoms. So so sort of this, this approach is kind of getting the context, the environmental context of what's going on, right? Now Florida, um, their one of their documents, University of Florida Extension, suggests ruling out insect problems first, and there uh, you know it's Florida, you know it's everything in Florida has. Um, ooh, sorry, is anyone from Florida? Can make a Florida joke. Um, uh, but they, and this is because often insect problems are easy to identify, uh, usually. You, it's really easy to tell if something's been chewing on it, or if you're actually seeing something crawling on it that's got six legs. So if you can rule that out, that's, that's a good place to start. And then rule out any environmental factors, so maybe you can go back and ask these environmental conditions. And then look for diseases, uh, diseases as a, as a so um, I, it is just because diseases are harder to diagnose because they're the symptoms can be tricky, um, they can be hard to see without microscopes especially. So before you go down that crazy rabbit hole, make sure you rule out abiotic causes and and pests first. Now, with uh, answering questions from the client, this is some suggestions from from uh, from Charlotte, the state director uh, extension. I mean. Mass Gardener Coordinator, um, and she mentioned like when you're answering them, make sure they're not trying to lead you down the wrong way. Like, and this this not, not, this isn't this is just apply for diagnosing problems, but if they call and ask how much lime do I have, you don't want to tell them an amount. You can't tell them an amount unless they've had a soil test, right? So don't don't you gotta you gotta just kind of bring them back. Like I can't really we can't know that until we do X Y and Z first. And then just, as I mentioned earlier, take what they say with a grain of salt, trust but verify. You know, what they call large and small and recent and not so recent may, may vary. And oftentimes, particularly if it's like a shrub or a tree, those, when they notice it does not mean that's when it started. <laughs> it's when they happen to notice it after several weeks probably. And then um, types of questions, um, 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 uh, you, you know, the, the you want to get as much information out of the client as you can. Interrogate them. It's okay. Be nice about it. Be a good cop. Interrogate them. But, but get as much as you can. If you if you get vague answers, you probably if they only get vague answers, you'll get probably get. A, uh, sorry. If you only ask vague questions, you'll probably get vague answers. So um, mm -hmm. ask what the plant is, what the site conditions are, uh, how it's growing, um, and and time. And then just general recommendations. Can you or the agent come to the yard? Uh, there's a quarter million people in Durham County. 
Um, there's 30,000 households right now in Chatham, so that would be 2,000 more in the next 15 years. Uh, if we did that, it's all we do. Uh, and we're not, we're, and we're also not government funded landscapers. <laughs> okay, so you need to try to have them send you photos or bring in samples to the office um, in most cases. Um, and then can you recommend specific landscapers or specific products? No, you can give them a list because we can't, we, we, we want to maintain our neutral reputation. You can give them uh, sets of folks like arborists in that area or whatever, um, or uh, 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 different kinds of products that contain an active ingredient, but you can't just say, go buy this, I endorse this. We don't want to say, again, uh, give the implication we're endorsing everything. And then you can't really tell them well, you can, um, you very strongly encourage them to read the label. Just say that it needs to be like a mantra, like every time you, like at the end of every sentence, you know, blah, 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 blah read the label. And, and because you, you don't want to be responsible for having them hurt themselves or plants or other people or things. So in terms of mixing, you know, you can say just consult the label for mixing. Uh, uh, then, then they should be reading the whole thing. You can give general over, you know, there's, there's nuance there, but make sure to have them always fall back on reading the label. Um, again, you know, where do they find the questions you would ask, where they found it, um, what are they, what are they, uh, um, what, what, you have photos of the insect, what plant is it on? Just like with diseases, pests start, tend to be host specific. And then if they're sending you photos, uh, um, it's got to be. <laughs> It's got to be um, great, so so um, they have to be good photos for you to do anything reasonable. Um, clear, in focus, as high resolution as possible. Sometimes when they attach photos, especially like a Gmail, it will appear in the body of the email, and then you click on it, it doesn't get any, the resolution sucks. So sometimes you have to, you may have to go back and forth to get a better image. Um, it's, you want more than one picture too. You want to see the context on the plant, so like a, particularly on a tree or shrub, like where is it appearing on the plant? How does it look over the total plant? Maybe some mid-range photos so you can see how it's proceeding to stay down a certain branch, if you can see the transition zones between healthy and infected tissues. And then uh, as close of an image as they can, so you can maybe look, even look for, for other structures that are uh, diagnostic. I mean, this, this was, uh, I should say, uh, there, there is, a, again, the diagnostic chapter has some good advice on how to take the photos, too. This was an actual picture I got sent, and so <laughs> I just told them to see the local optometrist or ophthalmologist. <laughs> I don't know what is going on here. And then uh, you can watch this at a later date. You may have watched it already, but there is a, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a video um, that answers this question, what is the secret answer in gardening questions, and that is to not to panic. Um, so there's a cute video that uh, Lucy and a few other um, specialists from other states did about that. It's like 10 minutes long. That is a, is a, a adorable uh, reenactment of a master gardener trying to handle a call and she's panicking. So they go through why you shouldn't be panicking. Um, and so that's a good video to watch. So it's linked, it'll be linked in the presentation. That's a hyperlink. Finally, um, um, you've probably already covered this too, but I want to just reiterate it for the purposes of today's activity um, on how to do, to find good information, uh, on how to do research in an extension context. So our, our like core identity is we are purveyors of research-based information or science-based information, right? That's what keeps us separated from, um, you know, gardenbullshit.com or whatever. Uh, so, so the, the idea is that we are translating and uh, uh, synthesizing information that comes from the Arvind Tower uh, and by, 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 by subject matter specialists and, and conveying it to people that is so they can apply it to their everyday lives, right? So, so, so there are, are people who study this on their lives and they write things and make videos about things and we are sending that out to people. Then they come to us, and if we can't answer it, we take it up the chain. They come to you, and you can answer it. You send it to Ashley, if Ashley can answer it, she'll send it up to specialists on campus to, to get the right answer to people. So that means that often what we're looking for is extension information uh, to answer these questions. 
are there cases where, and this is a nuanced point, so just listen carefully, <laughs> are there cases where you can find information that's not on an Accenture website um, to give you context, perhaps? Like if you're, really, if you're really going down a blind alley on the extension sites, um, okay, maybe that can provide you some information, but you never want to send that to a client. So maybe you, you, get, you get inspired by, you, you found some mentioning on some gardenbullshit.com forum that gave you an idea and that led you down, a, a, a narrow down a, your, your research queries that then you, you're able to verify an Accenture website. That's okay, perhaps. But well, you don't really want to send a client, well, I found this on this website and, you know, uh, yeah, so, but, so generally you want to try to convey and, and send out and get information from extension if possible or other uh, universities and, and scientifically based organizations. So, um, you know, we do have a lot of good stuff in North Carolina, but we don't have everything. And different universities have different strengths and different specialists at different times that write different things by different, by different things at different times. Uh, so, um, if you can, you know, you think, think regionally because the diseases or pests that occur in North Carolina probably don't occur in California and vice versa. It's a radically different environment once you can get past Mississippi. Um, uh, so, you know, consider that. Um, but, again, if they help provide some context for you, give you ideas, that's not a bad thing to do either if you're, if you're, if you're um, short of information. So, ideally, try to think regionally. If you can't find things from NC State, the, uh, our counterparts in South Carolina is Clemson University. That's a, that's still, despite the name, it's a public university, it's a, it's a land grant university. In Virginia, it's Virginia Tech. And, um, and then also there is um, South Carolina State, which is the um, HBCU, it's also a land grant university, they'll also have some information. And same thing here at NCAAT State, um, uh, Virginia State, and Kentucky State, and um, that, that those names kind of vary, um, uh, and in and, and extension speak, we, they, we call them either 1862 or 1890 universities, depending on when they got the land grant designation from, from Congress. Uh, so uh, look, look, look for things in Virginia or South Carolina or Georgia has a lot of information too to give you some more ideas, but um, just to verify if you can, in some cases, in certain situations, it's a North Carolina thing too, but usually it is. The Southeast is the Southeast in a lot of ways when it comes to, to prob problems and plants. So, uh, that can, so, so meaning, you know, if you start with extension or you can look at other university information. Um, and then uh, reputable botanic gardens, which are most botanic gardens. So, Ralston, uh, NCBG, I guess there's something at some, is there a school here? I forgot, what's it called? Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I'm just bitter because that they played a ball of cancer with the orange dirt tramp rat light rail. <laughs> but it's a good school. Uh, but so 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 Duke Duke Gardens will have some good information too. Um, and then other like um, uh, you know if you know it's a government agency, it's probably research it should be research based. Um, uh, so the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, the USDA, uh, SARE, which has a lot of good information on growing. Crops uh, that's part of USDA, and then like things like the like some some uh, professional organizations have a, good, a lot of good information. So this is the North Carolina Invasive Plant Council. Um, they have uh, a listing of what they consider to be invasive species. They may not may or may, or may not be state or federally listed, but they're mostly ecologists that are concerned about such things. The APS is the American Phytopathological Society, so that they're a society just for plant pathologists. And then there is the Weed Science Society too. Uh, so, what what is not good information? So, we don't rely on on you know what your your. I mean, she's really cool. Your your witchy aunt and does a lot of cool stuff for for, for, for good reasons. But always good for referencing uh, you know you know witchcraft isn't really helped with 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 some plant problems. I would say. So uh, keep that for, for other purposes maybe. Um, or, you know, some, um, you know, anecdotes or common remedies. They may or may not work, but we can't, if we can't back it up scientifically, then don't, don't send it on to clients. And then make sure, you know, like, in a lot of Google searches, I, I still don't know the origin of some of this stuff, but there is a non-existent newspaper. I lived two hours in San Francisco, and there's never, never, never been nothing in San Francisco. Gate, what is that? But they have a website, and there's a lot of information that was probably stolen from extension information verbatim. So sometimes you'll find 
interesting information from that website, but you got to verify the extension to first. And then there's guardiannowhow.com. I mean, again, there's a, there's a forum, and there's, who knows who's posting that stuff. Um, some some want to be extension agent, um, um, but so 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 be skeptical of sites like that. So so try try to answer extension information. So the way to find extension information, the way what I want you to do today, just to keep things straightforward, is to go to extension.org forward slash search. So uh, e extension used to be a much bigger deal than it is now, uh, but uh, what parts of that have remained is a. It's a cooperative of cooperative extensions. In this case, the extension search website is a customized Google search that will just search extension websites. It will do a nationwide search of all 50 plus extension agencies because we do have um, they, they, our equivalents in the territories, um, our occupied territories, um, uh, our remaining colonies like uh, Puerto Rico and the uh, Virgin Islands, et cetera. So, uh, but but uh, this is a good place to start. So you go to here, you can use a QR code here today. If you go, the old website was search.extension.org and still that's still in my vernacular and it will still take you there, but, but um, extension.org forward slash search will, will, will get you there just fine. And um, one thing, one, one tactic might be to start with searching just North Carolina. And so in that case, say put in leaf spot of pepper in CSU. And that will just look at North Carolina State uh, stuff. Or you do NCAT, NCAT is also the domain name for North Carolina A&T State University. And that will find, uh, that'll help you with other stuff too. Um, or put in um, VT from Virginia Tech, uh, et cetera. But usually you just, just put in the, your query here and you can, as, as the search comes up, you'll see a list of links and you can very easily see what university it's referring to and click on that link and it'll take you through some information. Out of just uh, anecdotally, uh, if, uh, what, what I've seen is uh, Clemson has a lot of good information on specific diseases, especially with vegetables. But um, Clemson has reformatted their website in the past two years, like they've completely rebuilt it. And so often Clemson articles do not appear in this extension search right now for some reason. So with Clemson, uh, Google, just use a regular Google search, put in tomato disease Clemson, or uh, there's a great article on uh, uh, weed management in warm season lawns, Clemson. So, so maybe it's more of a two-pronged approach. If, you're, if you don't find much here that's helpful, don't give up on Clemson, um, even though I despise the football team. I actually care about sports. <laughs> Beat OU in the next championship or something. You know. uh, good, good, good extension system. And some of their some of their agents, I think they call them something different there. But have you met many people from Clemson? Actually, they are amazing. And so they they've got they have far fewer of them, but they're really good. So um, it's a really good system. Just, just try to do a separate Google search with Clemson. Too. Um, but often you also find a lot of good stuff on pests, especially and diseases from. University of Minnesota. They've got nice uh, overviews there, and then Maryland is like, is, it has a lot of good stuff too. And yes, what am I doing now? Also, um, you can try the um, Appendix C in the handbook. That's a good appendix. It has a list of descriptive um, symptoms grouped by type of plant. So it'll be turf, uh, vegetables, shrubs, trees, etc. And that will list many of the most common problems. So if you don't want to do internet search and want to start there, that's not a bad place to go. And then um, in more detail, there is, if you go to our horticulture portal and look on the side menu, there's something called the uh, horticulture info search, also the vegetable info search, fruit info search, or for searches. Um, and you can try this too. This, this works okay. Uh, not ideal, what it's supposed to be doing, I don't know how I assume it's doing okay, is that if you, if you search all, it will search not only the NC State website um, of active articles, but also of archive articles and some research journals, which you may not have access to, and um, trade publications. So this can be particularly helpful like like ornamental plants, I found, more than anything. Um, and then another hint uh, I didn't include on the slide, I should have, 
write this down then. Um, there's something from Cornell, which is the, uh, the only private extension university in New York, that's New York's land grant university. They have something called Cornell Vegetable MD, because it's Cornell, of course, they have to have it. Uh, but but it's, it's a good website, it's a little old, but there's a lot of good information on many, many, many types of vegetable diseases. So Cornell Vegetable MD. Okay, so now, actually, that's my presentation. So, don't close your eyes for a second, because I didn't mean to. It's supposed to be blind. Okay, so, uh, we'll uh, take a break. Yes, what well, questions, and then we'll take a break. Yes? Um, is it true that sprinkler systems and watering kind of the wrong time of day, and then it gets really, really hot, is a common cause of leaf damage on yeah, uh, so um, I, um, I misheard the first part of your question. What? Um, it's sprinkler systems. You know, if you have a sprinkler oh. system on, um, and then it gets, so they get wet on the leaf. Oh, oh, oh. And then oh, it gets oh. super hot, or you have yeah. rain. Is, 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 I've is generally that found that not, <laughs> I think that's one of those myths. So, okay. it's, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think the, I would, I would want to verify that, but, but I, I think um, if, if you've, um, there's a professor at University of Washington named Dr. Linda Chalker Scott, and she has a well-known um, blog and Facebook group. She's she's our she's their equivalent of Lucy Bradley, and she so she, it's called the Garden Professors Blog, and she's had some publications that has kind of a, a brand around um, busting gardening myths. And I have a vague recollection that that's considered not that one of those myths. I, and I think the mechanism that's proposed is that. There's water droplets on the leaf, and that ref refracts light in a certain way that causes additional tissue damage. Right. I have not, I would say that I've never come across that as a causative agent in five years. I mean, it's the same with sort of the sprinkler heads, it's solar system versus the, you know, the, the four inch sprinkler heads for the same reason. People tell me to put the solar systems in so it Oh, 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 oh. Okay, okay, I see what you mean now. Okay, so this is not a light issue. Yes, so it can cause issues. Be, because um, um, you're creating a wet environment on the leaf surface, right. and that it can make it a lot more susceptible to infection. Okay. But the, does a leaf droplet on the leaf cause heat or light damage? I don't believe so, but I can check it every because I want to make sure I tell you right. But but the latter, yeah. So so for example, in a, from a management practice perspective, you want to water the soil whenever you can rather than watering, irrigating the leaves <coughs> because you want to reduce the opportunities for providing a environment that, is, that favors infectious agents. Because the longer a water is on the leaf surface, the more time you have for agents to potentially come in and, and oh, like, oh, this is a lovely wet human environment. I'll, I'll infect this leaf now. If a leaf is dry, especially with bacteria, because bacteria really do need wet surfaces. Uh, to, to be actively growing and even to survive in some cases. So, so if, if the, the longer, if, if you can keep the leaf dry, you can reduce the chances of successful infection. Sorry, I didn't okay, process that. Yeah, you. yeah. Is that, did I interpret that right? Oh, okay. Other questions so far? Yes? Oh, yeah, so, no, that's not a dumb question at all. In fact, it's a very hard thing to answer sometimes about, because it's, we'll ask, well, how much, am I watering enough or too much? Uh, uh, that, 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 yeah. Um, let me get there real quick, sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. Topic is, oh, almost there, almost there, okay. Um, okay, how to answer this. Um, you, first, you gotta know what plant it is because certain plants really don't, are, are more prone to these kinds of root rot diseases than others. Uh, for example, uh, hollies, uh, what else is really, it hates wet feet. Uh, all vegetable crops don't like wet feet. So, so if you know that it's a vegetable or certain kinds of landscape plants that are more prone to these, then that can be a kind of 
a tentative category you can place it as a potential cause. Um, knowing if um, you have to also ask the client, do you ever observe standing water around this planting area after a, a rain event, or an irrigation event? If so, how long is that area wet? If it stays wet for, you know, a day or something, you know that it's a, that's a poor draining site and it's more likely to cause disease and be too much water. If there is standing water, and but you do know that it is something like, say, a uh, cardinal flower or something that likes, likes it like that, then you can probably eliminate that as a cause. Uh, for general watering practices, uh, you know, the, in theory, most plants need about an inch of water a week, right? So if it hasn't rained an inch that week, you probably need to water it some, in under, particularly in the summer. But you're not going to actually have a, probably a, a I mean, you could have a rain gauge and you can measure all that, but, but it's not easy outside of like a lawn or irrigated vegetable situation to know exactly how much water you're putting on. So another way around that is to just do a manual check of the soil. And for most plants, uh, say a, you know, perennials and trees and shrubs or something, um, you know, stick your hand, feel the soil, stick your hand in several inches down, six inches down or something like that, four, four to six inches down. And if you can detect moisture, it's probably wet enough. <laughs> but if, if, if it feels dry that deep, um, then it's probably time for a watering event. And then you, you sort of pair that with uh, any observable symptoms of wilting, which is an obvious sign of, of a, either not enough water or a sign of root stress. So this can, wilting can be caused by a root problem, right? It doesn't have to be not enough water. If the roots are infected or they're drowned, they can't take up water to deliver the rest of the plant. So it's also it's still wilting. Right, so that that is kind of a that can be a kind of a tricky thing. So that that's where knowing the the cultural and environmental context can be helpful. Uh, that was a long answer. Sorry. Was that does that sort of help? And actually, give me add to that. I guess I would say too. I mean, sometimes you got to get in there and like really look at the roots themselves, right? Like I would rather start digging up a plant and do some destructive look looking to see if I know what's going on. And like what Matt's showing in that picture. Oh yeah. Okay. Where you have root rot, like the outer layer of the root will literally slough off. Yeah. Like it'll come apart. You know? yeah. So I would start getting in there if I'm concerned about it. Because at that point, the plant might already be dead. I'm like, let's find out. And the other thing, too, is a lot of times, so it'll slough off and it'll expose the center white. But good, healthy roots, they'll kind of naturally oftentimes be a lighter color. And you'll tug on them and nothing bad will happen, right? Like that darkening and sloughing, and you're like, Ugh. That, that ain't normal, yeah. yeah so, 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 so yes, very good point. So, so in an actual root rot infection, like that's caused by Phytophthora, if the if the tissue if the fungus of the oh my key, uh not real fungus if it's infecting the, the tissue, it's going to destroy the tissue. So that it's going to be a mushy, ugly mess. And as we said, yeah, you, just to show banner white, what you just said. <laughs> so what's happened in this photo is they act this outer layer called the periderm has sloughed off that inner part of the root. And that, that if you see that, that is guaranteed by top of the root rot. That's good enough. Yeah, yeah, so just, yeah, remove the whole plant. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. Um, so I, I, I understand how tricky all this is. This is, the, I think, to me, the hardest part. Of it is. All this it is. is, yeah. So um, I read somewhere once, with some caveats, that if one plant out of many of the same plant is affected. Oftentimes, and there's been enough time, and it's only one, you can usually narrow that down to an abiotic. Is that a good? Um, if it's one, so, it's, so say you have four of the same species, and it's one you affected? Four tealis, for example, and uh -huh. one has been, you know, not doing well and declining. And you've had some time, and the other ones don't appear to be. I know sometimes, like a homeowner will say, oh my gosh, I don't want to spread to the. Yeah. next one or whatever it i mean is that a general rule that you can yeah i would say that's yeah that's not a bad starting point right because but the key there is it hasn't changed over time how much time but if you if you saw well say over uh i don't know several weeks or months over that that same growing team okay especially uh yeah, yeah. 
Uh, this is where it gets, this gets messy. But, right, because abiotic is a good guess to begin with anyway, you said. Right, that's, that's, that's not, that's not, abiotic's not that place to start. We're not trying to rule that out. And, and that, unfortunately, in that case, that, there, that's easier to rule out, right? Because you can ask the client, did you do this? Has it been wet or whatever, right? Um, now, they sometimes answering the, did you plan it right questions are a bit harder. <laughs> um, uh, so, well, you know, sidebar, sidebar, sidebar. Um, it is surprisingly not uncommon to see plants planted too deeply. Uh, and so, particularly on a tree, that you should see a very subtle flare as it goes into the soil. If you see, if it looks like a, a, a pole coming out of the ground, it's probably planted too deeply. And depending on the plant, that could, it will be dead in five years guaranteed. I mean, uh, uh, like uh, a lot of evergreens, like a, uh, uh, arbor vitae are notorious for that, are being easily planted too deeply. But in your scenario, if it was just one plant that began, Having issues, and then you saw a change at all, then that is biotic. Right. Because the other scenario that's a biotic scenario is that uh, all of them are being affected at the same time. That also can be a biotic, right? Because something happened to those four plants. Like a frost. Yeah, like yeah. a frost. Uh, but in this case, in your scenario, specific scenario, what may have happened is something that that fourth plant was just bad. I mean, they got so this root bound, or they planted it wrong, or something wrong with the nursery. And it just never really established. So well. saying, let's wait and see if it hasn't been enough time, if there is a spread, is an acceptable thing because you would want to try to, you know, everybody wants a chemical solution, which we're yeah, not yeah, in yeah. the process, you know, in the business right. wanting to suggest. That's right. kind of what I think about when I talk to people because they're like, oh, but it's going to spread and kill everything. Well, you don't, you don't know that yet. Yeah. So, so in there, the the, the, the kind of prerogative, or whatever, is to to really rule out. There's no evidence of a sign or symptom of a disease. <coughs> so often, I mean, if it's an abiotic issue um, with the above ground issue, it's going to be a relatively uniform situation. So, I mean, the leaves are brown. You know. uh, but that can still be a root problem too. Maybe. And so that's when you do what Ashley suggested and they look at the roots. Because uh, often an actual disease will have specific signs and symptoms that you can Especially, and this again, like in, in, in your, your general search strategy, maybe start out with a search that says diseases of arbor vitae. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to really get 80, 90% of the potential diseases, right? And then if, if what you see in the image does not look like any of those diseases, then it's probably not left. Um, but it can get messy. <laughs> but, but, but just in, in, in probabilistically, that's probably the issue. Yes. Um, I've been trying to grow rhododendrons, which I think was a silly thing to try and do, but um, they kept dying. I mean, I could find of them, they kept dying. Yeah. And so I pulled one or two of them out the other day, and it sounds like the problem is what you just said. The roots were really, I thought it was root rot, uh -huh. but it, the only thing it was, they seemed very dry and very compacted. So it sounds like that was root bound. That Yeah, so so I would say that that in in uh, horticultural lingo, when we say just just to be put a fine point on, when we say root bound, it usually refers to um, how a woody plant was left in a pot for an extended period of time, it just wasn't sold out of the nursery, and so the roots grow out, they hit the pot, and they start circling, and then you got like this really funky ratio of roots to shoots, and um, uh, when that's taken out of the pot and put in the soil directly without significant manipulation of that compacted root mass, that can cause problems because they, the roots can't establish in the native soil well. Um, and then, but, but once it's in the ground and if the roots are not growing out, that may be uh, also an issue of compacted soils. So just a slight different terminology, but yeah, yeah. So, so technically when we say root bound, that usually means it came out of the pot all right. messy. And then if, if the roots are bound by the compacted soil, we'd say that there's too much soil compaction or something like that. Um, but with rhododendron, I'm not as, uh, there, there are, so, so rhododendron can mean the genus, and that can include azaleas. So all azaleas are rhododendrons, but not all rhododendrons are azaleas. But if it's a, if it's a proper rhododendron, there are, what is it, Catabense, that is, can be grown in the Piedmont, but a lot of them are like it a little bit further west. 
Um, so that may depend on the species. Um, back to the new and the new. <laughs> Sorry, just go ahead. Uh, yeah. if, if you do purpose a, a really root bound plant, is it best to cut it, you know, make a cut in it, or kind of tease the roots apart the best you can, or it just depends on the species? Or uh, a little bit of both. I mean, like generally, yeah, it's people. Um, I've seen Dr. Barbara Fair, who's our tree guru. She's made she's a She's amazing. And she has great videos about planting trees and shrubs too on, on YouTube. Um, the general idea is that people are far too timid about being aggressive against the roots. So the trees and shrubs being mean, you, know, you pack the crap out of those. Because if, if you're planting at the right time in the right conditions, um, it's, that's gonna encourage a lot of new root growth that will help the, the tree establish. So yeah, be, 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 be aggressive. I mean, just take, take your spade. Yeah. Um, now, with you know a little vegetable transplant, that's probably not ideal. But 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 um, unless you know something like broccoli, you don't like to eat or something, not, which is delicious. But, um, uh, but but yeah yeah. Okay. And then you and then you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so I work at a farm, and one of the things we specialize in there is tomatoes. So uh -huh. I have six varieties: heirlooms and then you know different varieties. Although I don't really know what they are, Yeah, so in that case, it's, it's good to have, I would say, in some, in some cases, it's just good to have that, um, that kind of potentiality in your, in your brain uh, because it does have actually stink book being has a very specific look. So what you saw, tell me if I, if I, can, I can read your mind. So it was a, the tomato was red, it was relatively ripe, and then there was kind of an uneven yellow splotchiness yes. kind of randomly around the tomato. And what's happened is the, the uh, stink bugs, uh, what's it called? Proboscis. But, but there's another name for stink bugs. Anyway, it's, it's harpoon like mouth appendage. Um, pierced the tissue, sucked out the juiciness inside, and that destroyed the surrounding tissue a bit. And so the mealiness was from the collapse of the individual cells, and they removed some of the uh, contents that included the pigments. Um, um, so, so, it, but it, it's a very good, yeah, it's a very good lesson. So, if you, in fact, I think I had a picture of it. Um, I'll just do it. Yeah, yeah. So, for, for other people's um, reference, it, it is a, it's a very common um, injury to. Um, nope. Provide. Let's see. This takes more than thirty seconds. We'll do it later. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so yeah, it's good to know that, and uh, um, for for if you if you want, this is kind of cheating for later. But Clemson has a great publication on tomato diseases and a great publication on tomato pests. That should be your two go-to references. Uh, do tomato diseases Clemson tomato di pests Clemson. Uh, so then obviously, like in that instance, since I work in the tomato department, I'm looking at yes. just tomatoes all along. I would ask more about yes. yes. Like yeah. the rest of the plant would be like my questions with it would be if, if I was if someone called and said my tomatoes have spots then I would be asking a lot more questions about what the plant look like you know where yeah yeah like where where, like where where yeah where you see the spots, spots. Right. and and notice that so here here is an example of of sting bug feeding and so what what to me looks different than um, some of the tomato fruit diseases is most of them are going to be uh, you're going to see a little bit of a ringing pattern it's going to be Probably more, a little bit more uniformly distributed. Because I mean, imagine what a stink bug would do if you land in one spot, he or she would land in it, whatever. You know, the stink bug would land on one spot and just go pop, 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 pop. Delicious, delicious, delicious tomato. Thank you very much. Um, whereas a disease, it, it may, uh, particularly it's bacterial, uh, it's more commonly, I think, a bacterial disease than tomato fruit. Uh, and, and so that could be one splashing event that can make it be a little more even. And you'll see, um, oh, on fruits. Um, that, that sometimes, like on um, with some bacterial diseases on fruits, you'll see like a very 
almost greasy appearance, like the slight, slight discoloration, and, and, and in the literature it's called a like greasy spot, um, kind, of, kind of a grayish coloration thing. I mean, just a little bit different than that. So, so I would say for your, for your specific reference, look at um, bacterial speck of tomato and contrast that to uh, stink bug feeding, and you'll get a good gestalt for that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and something I want to add to is like, this is a lot, but just like we talked about in botany, right? It's all green, right? And then you start learning families and you start learning the plants and all of a sudden, like, after a while, after you've looked at it long enough, you start getting this sense of like, no, I just don't think that's what that is, right? Like, you develop that skill as you go. And in general, right, if someone calls me in the summer and they're like, I have weird yellow on my tomatoes, like, I've got like two answers, right? You learn that too. So like over time, you will come to look at that and you will say, it doesn't quite look right for a disease. Like it, it just doesn't, you know what I mean? And so that's something you'll develop. And I know that's like a really frustrating answer right now, but it will happen, it will come. And all of a sudden you'll be amazed because it'll start clicking and you'll start figuring out where to put things in your mind. And, and, and yeah, yeah and, and then it, it gets, you're always learning new stuff. Yeah. And that's one of the most fun parts of our job at your volunteer efforts, your, your unpaid job, <laughs> is that, that every time something comes in, you get to learn something new. So it's very really fun. Yeah, yeah, you had a question? Yes, uh, could you explain the term or speak to the term uh, hydrophobic? Uh -huh. what, what? Yes. In, in, what, in what context? Probably for soil. Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so, so hydrophobic means water fearing. Um, and in the case of a hydrophobic soil, there's probably some uh, uh, constituents, or say in, in, in like a, a media, like peat moss or something, that has a uh, chemical and or other structural attribute that makes it hard to wet initially. Um, in other context, is that, is that is that a good context for it, or what else? Whether yeah, it means like water resistant, water um, not prone to being wet, wetted. But it, it does not mean that the plant itself is resisting the water. Well, um, so no, effectively no. But plant tissues, like particularly leaf tissues, are covered in a waxy layer. Um, and they have and the first layer of cells are fairly tightly bound to each other and have glue between them. So you can say those are hydrophobic because it's preventing water from evaporating out of the leaf um, and, in, and preventing water from, from in, um, in, some, in many cases, from getting into the, in, 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 through that route. So those are sort of hydrophobic surfaces, I suppose. Um, what other context would that be helpful? Do you see that happen more when people only amend a certain planting hole? Like what, what, what is causing that? They're putting stuff in like either potting soil or other wrong uh, things amendment like Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so because a lot of potting media contains peat moss. So people aren't getting rid of that. Yeah, like, yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's, good. that's really good. too much compost just in a planting hole to create, I mean, is that, is that what you're asking? Like what causes that? Right, that's part of it, yeah. So, go ahead. Sorry, so this, sorry. This is something we see, um, I'll just say it. So this is something we've seen occasionally out at Briggs, for example, because we've been top dressing the compost for so, so long, because um, people have this feeling of like, some is good, more is better. And so if you look at the way that things like organic matter and compost hold soil, it's, or hold water, it's actually really, really interesting. They hold water really, really, really well for a long time until they reach a certain level of dehydration, right? Like once they hold below a certain level of water, they plummet and they don't want to hold water. Like you just don't want to do it. Um, and so to rehydrate them can be really, really, really difficult. And in that dehydrated phase, a lot of the soil biology starts start breaking down, like a lot of the critters, worms, germs in the soil, they don't have the water they need, the roots don't have the water they need. And so it's one of those reasons why when you say, I'm gonna fill a veggie bed, right, a raised bed, should I still compost? I'm like, oof. <laughs> you should be starting with a three to one soil to compost mix. And even then, a lot of the topsoil you're buying from the garden center or wherever has a lot of organic matter in it already. So like, some is good, that does not mean all is better, right? And it's because of these really interesting, like actual, it's like the molecular properties of some of the organic matters and how they hold water. 
Yeah. So that's an abiotic issue. Yeah. Yeah. And so as you can see on vultures too, if, if you like like triple shredded hardwood will get really matted and then that can kind of sort of be a hydrophobic type surface more if you're just a little bit. Yeah. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the hydrophobia. Yeah. So